Welcome to Island Baptist Church. Today's sermon by Dr. Bill Waddell is in Luke 8, The Soil of the Heart, Part 3. Luke chapter 8, we're working our way through the book of Luke, and we find ourselves here in chapter 8, and we're camping out on a particular portion here for a while, the parable of the soils, and uh, it's going to be our final time together over that as we conclude that, uh, I guess you could say, a mini-series uh, within it. Luke chapter 8, Jesus tells a parable. The, the, the big point of the parable is Jesus trying to relay to us, why, why, why do some people not accept Christ? And why is it that every time I share somebody, you know, the, when, when the truth came to me, I, I jumped right at it. And, and why do others not? And uh, why do some who seemingly uh, accept Christ uh, then turn around and, and it's like their lives haven't been changed? And he answers those questions here in this in this parable, and, and the, the main point of the parable, or among the, uh, the bigger point to me at least, is the such, such small emphasis is placed on the sower. Uh, I love that, uh, because we put so, we've, we've, we've done so much, I think, atrocities to the whole idea of what it means to share your faith. We've made it so complicated. You know, you gotta have an education, you need to go through training, you have an, and, and I'm not saying we shouldn't do those things, but, but somehow when, when we emphasize those things, it's almost like if you haven't done this, then you cannot share your faith, and it's just like, no. The sower is, is a very simple process. I mean, you're dumping seed on the ground. There's not a lot to that. Like, I don't have to have, like, doctor degree and, you know, I mean, the person that's never done it before, I can hand, hand him a bag of seed and say, spread the seed. Okay. Does he need more, what, what does he need more information for? I mean, he doesn't. So, so it's, it's, I find it very interesting in uh, reading a, a story by a pastor talking about how easy it is or how, how simple it is to share the good news, to, to share our faith and how uncomplicated it ought to be. And he tells the story of the experience he had with his four-year-old daughter. And he has a, had a nine-year-old and a seven-year-old at the time. They lived in a neighborhood kind of on the corner and uh, they were the popular house. You know, all the kids were coming over to their house and it was a Saturday and it was kind of the typical thing. They were playing football in the front yard. Well, the four-year-old wants to go be with the bigger kids. And he knows, you know, she's going to get out there with a bunch of boys and older girls, and, and it's, it's going to end one way. And the end is she's going to be coming through this door crying. They push me over. They hurt me. Well, it's like, sweetie, you're four years old, you know, but if you want to go out there, you know, so they send her out, and sure enough, five minutes later, here she comes, you know, tears streaming down her face. You know, the big kids, they're, they're mean. They're this and that. And so his wife was standing there, and she was baking cookies for all the kids, but she'd only baked the first batch, and so she gave some cookies to the little girl and said, you know, here you go, pass fire for a minute. But, but don't tell anyone, she said. I'm cooking for all the kids, but, but don't let them know you've got cookies because then they're going to want to all come cookies, and I, I'm not ready for it. She said, took her two seconds to walk over the screen door and yell out to all the kids in the front yard, I got cookies! <laughs> and he said, you know, it dawned on me, it's that simple to sell, share the good news. It's just that simple. You've got cookies, and they don't, and they need them. It's no more complicated than that. Like I said, as we said a couple of times here, if you know enough to be saved, you know, you know enough to tell someone how to be saved. It's, it's not that complicated. It's, it's one beggar telling another beggar where they found food. I mean, you think about it. So it's not complicated. It, it, just back to our, the pastoral scenario here that we have here that Jesus, and we're going to get to it, but we're, we're going to read it. But you, you take a farmer back in these days, and how would, he train, how would a farmer train his five-year-old son? Give him a sack of seed that goes around his shoulder and over his neck, and there's the little pouch there, and puts him over in a corner and says, son, I want you to sow this piece of ground. Does he need to tell him anything more than that? Can a kid dip his hand into a bag and pull out seed and throw it on the ground? Yes. So what's going to happen to the seed? Is it going to get on the ground? Yes. Where is it going to be? Where else? It's going to be in his hair. It's going to be down his shirt. You know, it's going to be in his pockets. But, but listen to me. The seed that he sows on good ground is going to be no less effective than the seed that his professional, if we can call him that, father farmer sowed. The seed is the same seed, the soil is the same soil, and it has the same effect whether it comes from a five-year-old or a 50-year-old. Again, we overcomplicate this process. So I'm, I'm done preaching on the sower because it's not a parable of the sower. It's actually a parable of the soil. The, the sower is effectively irrelevant. Yeah, somebody's got to spread the seed. The seed is effectively irrelevant. It's the seed that does all the work, but it's, in, it's unchangeable. It doesn't matter where it hits, it's, it's the same seed. The difference between someone accepting Christ and not accepting Christ is, as if we could use this, this scenario here, is the soil of their heart. So let's read the parable in Jesus' application here, beginning in verse 5. The sower went out to sow. 
his seed. And as he sowed, some fell along beside the road, and it was trampled underfoot, and the birds of the air ate it up. And other seed fell on rocky soil. As soon as it grew up, it was withered away because it had no moisture. And other seed fell among thorns, and thorns grew up. So this is the third soil. And here's the fourth one. Thorns grew up and choked it out. Here's the fourth one. And the seed fell into this good soil, and it grew up, and it produced a crop of a hundred times as great. And he said to these and he said these things, he would call out, he who has an ear, let him hear. This parable is unknowable unless Jesus tells it to us. But he does. And the interpretation of the parable begins in verse 12. Take a look. Those beside the road, that's the first soil. They are those who have heard all four of these here. They all hear the same message. They all hear, they're all sown by the same sower, if you will. But the results are different. The one by the road is those who have heard, and then the devil comes and takes away the word from their heart so that they may not believe and be saved. So the first one is a person obviously is not saved. They're not. The, the, the anomaly or the, the, the difficult thing of the, of the parable is that neither are the next two souls. We would like to say that they are, but actually, biblically, they're not. Only the last, the one that produces fruit, is. Again, what's the whole point of the word? To produce fruit in your life. That number one fruit is salvation. So if you have no fruit from a plant, guess what you've got? You've got no salvation. So again, let's interpret this correctly. Apply it correctly. So that's the first soil beside the road. Then the second soil, number, uh, verse 13. Those on the rocky soil are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy. So they, they make a public profession. Does that save you? No. Saying that you believe in Jesus, does that save you? No. Nope. Praying a prayer after the pastor as he led you in prayer, does that save you? I mean, I wished it did, guys. I wish there was some kind of magic dust, but there's not. It's only those who truly believe in Christ. What does that look like? Time and trouble will tell it. That's the story. Time and trouble, how do you know they're really saved? Time and trouble will tell it. That's how you'll know. You won't know by the tears that they shed, because this person comes with joy, right? They, they have emotions. These have no root, it says. They believe for a while. You can't just believe for a while unless you haven't really believed. Mark it carefully. Mark it carefully. And then time of temptation, they fall away. And the seed which fell among the thorns are these ones who have heard, and they go on their way. So they seem to have made a public profession also. But, but time and trouble tells us that actually it never took root. It was choked out, the worries and riches, the pleasures and the life, and it brings no fruit. That's so important. Because the fruit is salvation. And the seed on the good soil... These are the ones who have heard the word in an honest and good heart and hold fast and bear fruit with perseverance. So three out of the four that you share with, if we're going to take Jesus' ratio here, three out of the four, three quarters of those that you share with are not going to come, at least initially, not to faith in Christ. Now, uh, the, the good thing about these soils, it doesn't say this is a permanent condition for them. Can they be changed? Yes, by God's grace. By God's grace, many of us here can see I was one of these soils. I was one of these that came, you know, but it was superficial. I was one of these who had a stony heart, and I just rejected it out of hand. I've, I've read, I've heard testimonies. I've, I've seen that. I was raised in a great home in a Baptist church, and, and I came forward when I was seven years old. You know the reason why I did? Because that's what my brother did. And I didn't want to be left out. Does that save you? It didn't. It wasn't for another year that I actually understood it. Just to go forward, because that's what everybody else is doing, <laughs> That's not the reason to come to Christ. I had no understanding of my sin. I came to understand it. And then if you don't understand your sin, you have no reason to understand what a Savior is. I did, by God's grace. So it, it, it happens that way. So, yeah, my soul wasn't, a, wasn't ready for it yet, but it did become ready by God's grace, and the same as we are hoping for all those we're sharing with. But this is so, so that we can understand that there's different responses. And the minority response, actually, unfortunately, is true faith. So, so let's consider it together. So, so we're, sowing is not complicated, right? What, what's difficult is growing a plant. What's difficult is sharing the truth. That's not complicated. Getting a person to believe, that is. In fact, I would say, as far as you're concerned, impossible. We cannot make people believe. That's the work of God. Our work is to sow the seed. This parable of the soils tells us that some will reject because their hearts are like concrete, and others will reject because, as we saw last time, they accept a version of Jesus that they like. They're even emotional about it. But their version of Jesus won't save you. 
The, the, the gospel of Jesus helps me with my finances, helps me with my marriage, Jesus makes me happy, those are not gospels, guys. Now, Jesus can do all those things, but that's not the gospel. The gospel is you need to be rescued from your sins as a sinner, hell-bound, separated from God, catapulted into eternity where you'll forever be separated from God in a place of torment. You need to be rescued from that. Jesus is that rescuer. Jesus is that rescuer. That is the gospel. The fact that you're headed there, all of us are headed there, but that God has intervened by his son Jesus Christ, taken your hell so that you could have his heaven. That is the gospel. Not that Jesus is going to make your marriage better or your finances better. I hope he does. He can. But there's no guarantee in the scriptures. There is a guarantee of everlasting life through the real Jesus. Have you trusted him? That's the big question. And, and then, so that's the rocky soil. They come to their version of Jesus, and then the soil among the weeds is a person who already has their Savior. Their Savior is their stuff. They love the world. They love the things of the world. They're focused on the things of the world. So you share Jesus. We're like, oh, yeah, I can take Jesus. I mean, if I don't feel like I need another thing, but, I'll, you know, if Jesus wants to be a spare tire on my life, that's awesome. Listen, that's not a Jesus that saves you. That's not a real Jesus. So this person has the spare tie Jesus on their lives, but their heart is committed to the world. And look at what the Bible has to say about a person like that. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Notice it doesn't say the love of the Father is diminished in him. Love of the Father was never there. It was never there. How do you know a person who's a faker? And when I say a faker, I'm not disparaging them. People are coming forward in all honesty, but they don't really understand what their real need is. So they're making some kind of decision that pleases us because the Baptist has got to have decisions so we could write it in a paper and send it off to the convention, you know, because holy cow, that's important. And we really want them to be saved, don't we? We really do. But, but how do we know that they're, they're fakers? They're, they're not trying to, to be dishonest. How do we know they're fakers? Time and trouble. Let trouble come into their lives, you'll know. Let time advance in their lives, you'll know. The same was true with, with, with these guys. Because the love, the love of the Father is not in them, how do you know? Give it time. Give it time. Then you'll know. You're not going to know by the profession they make. When somebody says, I want to accept Christ, you say, okay, great. And what do we say after that? We think, we think they're Christians. Not a reason to not think that. But time and trouble will tell you. Time and trouble will tell you whether a plan is good as well. Here's some illustrations from the scriptures, and we're not going to read them, but just some illustrations from Jesus' own ministry and experience. So there's a story in the Bible of this guy called a rich, wrong ruler. We, we call him that. Very wealthy man, young man, comes to Jesus. Now, first of all, can we all say that that's awesome? Anybody come into Christ, we don't want to stand in the way of that. So that's great. This guy is coming to the right person, is he not? Now, if I ended the story right there and said there was this rich guy who came to Jesus, would we all say, well, he's going to be in heaven with us? See, that would be your conclusion if you didn't know the rest of the story. If you know the rest of the story, you know he's not. But not only does he come to Jesus, this is critical, he comes and asks the most important question. What must I do to inherit everlasting life? That is life's biggest question. So he's come to the right person. He's asked the right question. If we end the story there, we all conclude this man's saved, right? Read the rest of the story. Jesus knows where his real heart is. He's one of these weed guys. He's off in the weeds. He's already got a savior. He loves his stuff. He loves his life. He loves the world. He loves the things in the world. Somebody said he needed Jesus also. He's like, okay, Jesus can be a spare tire on my life. That's all right. One, I got a place for Jesus. So he comes to give Jesus, you know, to get the little help that he needs from Jesus. Jesus puts his finger right on his issues. He says, okay, so if you want to be my follower, go sell all that you have. See, like I said, time and trouble will tell it, right? I mean, so a person comes forward and accepts Christ as personal savior. How do we know they truly believed? Time will tell it. Trouble will tell it. There was no way for Jesus to stand there and wait for this guy's life to unravel and, and really see where he was headed. So he just fast for, hit the fast forward button and he went off, put his finger on it right immediately and says, okay, go sell all your stuff. He already knew where his heart was. It wasn't for him. He loved his stuff. He just thought, you know, one more thing in my stuff, Jesus can become a part of my entourage here. And the guy said it went away sad because why? Because that was his God, not Jesus. He didn't really want Jesus. He didn't want the price 
that it takes to say, you know, I'm going to lose it all anyway. I need Jesus in my life. I, I need to be rescued from the hell that's coming for me. No, he thought he'd found life, and, and this is going to deliver me from all the stuff that I have. And, and of course, it says that G Jesus was sad because the guy went away. And, and I find it very instructive and, and interesting. So, so if Jesus couldn't get through to the guy, what makes you think you will? See, we think everybody we share with should come to Christ. If you only were trained better, if you were as good as Pastor Bill, everyone would get saved, right? Listen, you're not going to be better than Jesus, are you? You're not going to hit it on the head better than Jesus. The guy went away unsaved. Here's another story. This wasn't just one, people, one group. This wasn't just one person. This was a mass of people. There was a group of people following Jesus, and they were on the one side of the Sea of Galilee, and Jesus had been teaching them all day, and they were a long ways from anything, anywhere to get food. And his disciples come to him and said, Jesus, dismiss these people so it's late in the evening so they can eat. And Jesus says, no, you feed them. Of course, he knew what he was going to do. You know the story. Five loaves, two fish later, a couple of breakings of breads and fish, and he feeds over 5,000. In fact, uh, 5,000 men, which that would assume at least 5,000 women and 5,000 children. So 15 to 20,000 lives, right, are changed. So they've listened to Jesus teach all day. They've seen Jesus do one of the biggest miracles in the whole Bible. Wouldn't we all conclude everybody got saved? Well, they all went home saved. If, ha haven't, haven't you thought about your loved one, the one you're praying for, that wants to, you want to come to Christ, if Jesus would just do a miracle in her life? Haven't you thought that? in his life, in their life, then they will be saved. God's holding up your loved one, maybe you're assuming this, by not delivering them into a miracle. It's just simply not true. So he does a massive miracle in front of all these people. In fact, not only does it, it, it to a degree, it works because it says that they wanted to immediately make him king by force. So they've heard Jesus all day, they've seen him do a miracle, and now at least to a degree they believed on Jesus as the Messiah, have they not? If I ended the story right there, we'd all say, well, they're all saved. They're all Christians. They weren't. In fact, Jesus says well, he was so displeased by the reaction that he dispersed the crowd. Man, show me a televangelist today that gets 20,000 people to come to the altar and says, listen, I need y'all to go back where you are. But that's what Jesus does. That's a shocker, isn't it? Maybe Jesus, if he'd gotten his teeth capped and his hair plugged and gotten a big auditorium with fancy lights, he could have gotten all these people saved, but he couldn't get them saved. He disperses the whole crowd. It's amazing. And it's, of course, it's where he sends his disciples off across the Sea of Galilee. He walks out on the Galilee halfway the night, and Peter comes out to him, you know, all the story. And they land on the other side, on the far side of Galilee, where the crowd is dispersed and walked around that evening and that morning, and they find Jesus on the other side, back in his hometown, Capernaum. They find Jesus... And they are excited to find, isn't it awesome that people find Jesus and they find Jesus like, oh man, I want to follow, I want to, I want to be with you, Jesus. Yeah, as long as it's for the right reasons. Let's watch what these people do. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you get here? No, that's fine, right? I'm awesome. I mean, I'm, I'm available. I think our church is open to anyone who's seeking for Christ, aren't we? Do you understand? Jesus knew something about these people that you don't know and that we can't know. Jesus answered them and says, truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me. We would, we would think that's awesome. Everybody who seeks Jesus is going to be saved. No. Nope. No. Nope. See, you seek me, but not because you saw signs, but because you ate some loaves and were filled. See, see you just want me as, as, a, as, a, as a dole, as a handout, as a spare tire on your car here. You don't want me for what I really am. He goes on in the next verse. Do not work for the food that perishes. They were coming to their version of Jesus. Jesus helps me with my life, and he makes my finances better. And I've, I've already got a plan for my life, and all my stuff is in order. But if Jesus could feed us on a regular basis, that would be great. That's not what Jesus is for. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that lasts for eternal life, which the Son of Man will get. You're coming to me, and that's great. But you're coming to me for the wrong reasons. And they've heard him preach. They've seen him do miracles, and yet they still have their idea of who Jesus is. And let me tell you something, that idea of Jesus will not save. It does not, and it's very clear that it does not. If you go down in the same chapter, notice what happens. As a result, so Jesus has been laying on the line with them, and as a result of them really hearing the truth, guess what they do? As a result of this, many of his disciples left 
it would no longer walk with him because Jesus didn't do what they wanted him to. Jesus wasn't the Jesus they thought that he was supposed to be. Jesus was supposed to be the spare tire of my life. He's supposed to feed me when I want, give me what I want. I already have my plans. He's supposed to come along and put a little stamp of approval on top of it. No. That Jesus will not save you. He didn't hear, and he won't today. So let's think, let's think about it for a second. Now, these are not backslidden Christians. These are Christians are too young to, to, uh, to have the faith to follow. These are fakers. They're not real believers. They never were real believers. They were coming to Jesus for their idea. Jesus should approve that, but he doesn't. Jesus, did, did, did Jesus need to, did he need to learn how to present the gospel better? If Jesus had just gone to one of our Baptist seminaries, he'd be way better at this. Like I said, get his teeth capped and his hair plugged and get a big auditorium and get some really hyped up music. That's what it was. If he had just done that, then these thousands would have been saved and not be in hell today. Who knows if their hearts actually changed eventually. Like I said, they're, they're, they're just revealing to you their hearts here. Jesus is showing their hearts. He knows them. See, we don't know. Somebody's, somebody's coming after Jesus and, and wants Jesus. What do we do with them? We give them Jesus. But whether or not they actually accept him, time and trouble will tell it. Time showed these guys were fakers. And not just one or two, a bunch, a whole bunch. So, so, so maybe Jesus doesn't need to be more educated in presenting the gospel. Maybe the word of God had a low day. It just, there are some days, I had a bad day yesterday, not a bad day, I just had a low day. I told my wife that, I said, just, I don't know, I think I just got up in the morning, drank a bunch of coffee and didn't drink anything else. And then I had a wedding on the beach and I got out there hot and I was just kind of, you know, unfortunately, Turning 54, you got, I don't know, like two months shopping days left till then, so just so you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm just, you know, you run out of steam. I'm not typically not that person, but, but may, maybe that happens, to, maybe the Word of God runs out of steam sometimes. Is that it? Some, some days it's effective and other days it's not. Some days it's powerful, right? Some days it's not. Is that true? No, of course not. So, so they're, given, they're given the gospel by the Son of God, who explains the word of God, and yet this is the result? Again, it's just underscoring and illustrating the illustration that we already have in front of us. Three out of four, if we follow the ratio, are not true believers. They're not. They're just not. So if their response to Jesus is thus, what will their response to, be, to you be like? So, not a reason not to sow. In fact, it's even more reason to sow. Everybody, listen, talking about heaven, as they say, ain't going there. They're not. You need to hold on to them. Pray for them. Pray that God reaches their heart. So, so now we've dealt with the souls that are unsaved. Now let's deal with the one that is truly saved. Verse 15, we, we read it, but let's go back over it again. The seed in the good soil, these are the ones who have heard the word. Just like everybody else, they heard it. But it, they reacted differently. They've heard the word, and in an honest and good heart, and, held, and hold fast to it, because that's the classification of a true believer, they hold fast, and bear fruit, and maybe the most important word here is with perseverance. So unlike the previous two soils, where time and trouble showed what they really were, time and trouble shows what this one really is as well. They start producing fruit. The first fruit is salvation. The first fruit is they're truly saved, they truly believe, and it's demonstrated by, like I said, the most important word here, perseverance. Trouble made the stony heart, right? The, the, the sun, uh, you can't tell if there's stone under there. The dirt here, over, and over there looks the same. That looks like good dirt. This looks good, good dirt. I sow both, the plant comes up in both of them. How will we know if one's in a stony place? The trouble of the sun. The sun gets really hot, the plant on the stone dies. The plant in the good soil doesn't. In fact, it gets better. You've got to have sun to grow a good plant, don't you, and produce fruit. fruit. So, so trouble demonstrates and time demonstrates that the one that's in the weedy soil actually is just full of weeds. Not a real believer. Time demonstrates that. Trouble demonstrates the rocky soil. But time and trouble, listen, demonstrate something totally different with a real believer. Watch. James 1, 2 and 3. Consider it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you encounter various trials. There you go. Knowing that the testing, there it is, 
of your faith produces what? Endurance, perseverance. T time and trouble just make the good plant better because the seed has really found a place and they've really been changed. See, that's what we're really after here. We're not after professions of faith, even though that's all we can go by. We're not after people praying a prayer in unison with the pastor, even though that's all we can go by. We're after real change of heart. We can't affect that. We can pray for it. We can preach about it. We can hope for it, but only God brings it about. So time and testing made the real plant persevere. Time and testing made the bad plant, so the plant's in the bad soil. It's really about the soil. It's not about the plant. The, real, the, the, real, the bad plants or the bad soil, they abandoned. They did not persevere. So uh, let's, and let's get to one more issue here because it, it may cause us some problems if we don't. So it says in the seed in the good soil, so you're one of those, right? I hope you are. Trusted, truly trusted Christ for the right reasons. The real Savior saving you from hell because of your sin, separated from God. Is that the Jesus you're believing on? Not the Jesus save your marriage, save your money, fix your, fix your home, I don't know, your broken leg. The real Jesus? Okay. So that means you're good, right? Because that's what it says here. No, you're not. <laughs> Keep going. You're the, the ones who heard the word in the honest and good heart. So holy cow, it says twice that I'm honest and good. So it's because I'm awesome that God saved me. He saves awesome people because I deserve to be in heaven anyway, and Jesus just took me there. Is that what the way we should interpret this? Heck no. You're not awesome. Go back to the illustration. Forgive me. You're dirt. Dirt is dead. Dirt is stinky. Dirt is nasty. Dirt doesn't do anything. You stop taking credit for your salvation. It's the same dirt, by the way, that's on the path. It's the same dirt that's in the rocky soil. It's the same dirt that's in the weeds. It's the same dirt. You take it to a lab and you melt it down and you find out what chemical compounds are in it, you find out they're the exact same. It's the conditions of the soil, not the soil. All soil is dead. It's, it's because, listen, because of a, a concern of a sower and the power of a seed that you are where you are today. You were dirt. Dirt doesn't go find anybody. It doesn't go looking for the seed. It just lays there. The seed never comes. Guess what? It remains dirt forever. But you're not dirt anymore because the seed has come to you because someone, a sower cared to sow the seed into your life and the power of the word of God began to work and here you are knowing Christ as personal savior. Praise, praise God, right? That's, that's awesome. But the dirt is just simply a medium in which the word of God takes root. So again, back to our parable and back to the real issue here is our concern is not about the sower. It's not about the seed. It's about the soil. And it may be because it's been true as I've been studying this, as I constantly going back to the word, it always corrects my theology and my thinking and I always need correction. And I'm sure you're the same way. It may be that you're like me and that as we've been going through this, you started thinking about people that you know who you weren't really sure are saved and now you're pretty sure they're not. And I want to talk to you about those people. Do we really know? No. No, we really don't. Time and trouble will tell it. But Jesus knows. And Jesus isn't telling me, not any more than he's telling you. But, but you can be concerned, and I would say according to this parable, you have every reason to be. Because it looks like the weeds have grown up in their lives, and, and it looks like they never really believed. Maybe so. I would suggest to you that's the way you need to pray. It may look like they're, they're, it's shallow and they made this shallow commitment because now they've fallen away and they're off involved in, in other stuff. And so you're worried, were they really saved? I would say you need to pray that way. It's better to assume that they're not, but they really are, than to assume that they are, but they're really not. You follow me? So how do we need to pray for these people? We need to pray that something will happen in their lives that you and I cannot do. I can sow the seed. I can be accurate with the Word of God, but I cannot grow a plant. The plant growing comes from the Holy Spirit. And He, when He comes, will convict the world of right, of regarding sin and righteousness and judgment. See, people don't come to a Savior until they understand they need to be saved, you see. see I don't think I'm going to person that God would throw into hell anyway. Well, then Jesus, I'm not going to come to the real Jesus. I'm going to have a spare tire, Jesus. Shallow commitment, Jesus, is going to help me with my finances and marriage, Jesus. But the real Jesus that's going to save me from an eternity in hell, 
Well, until I understand that I'm a hell-bound person, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. You and I need to be very concerned about people like that. We need to pray the work of the Spirit on them, confirming them. Awesome. I would love to be more confirmed about some people in my life, honestly. But more, more than anything, that they, before God, would be confirmed. And, 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 and if, if there's a reason that they're not, that they would come to a conviction about who they really are, and thus to a real faith and a real Savior. Let's, let's end that way. Let's, let's pray together that way. I want to ask you, please, to bow your heads and close your eyes. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the salvation that comes to us through your Son, Jesus. And I pray for the one here, Lord, or the one listening who may have some shallow faith based on some contrived Jesus or is really just wanting Jesus somehow as a spare tire on their life, not, not really a rescuer. They never see themselves as one drowning in an ocean of sin who, who only has one rescuer, and that is Jesus. Lord, I, I pray for that person, he or she, would come to real faith. And we pray for those loved ones, Lord, like I said, these ones that are on our hearts that we just wonder. We really don't know, Lord. We know ultimately you know. We pray for them. We pray for the work of the Spirit in their lives, convicting them of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. The truth's going to come out eventually. It's all going to be out in all eternity. It's going to be available to all of us. But, but the truth needs to come out now in their lives, Lord, so that they don't uh, pass out of this life in the condition they're in. Lord, we lift this up to you. We thank you for speaking to us today. We thank you for this parable that teaches us such, such important things that we need to know. I pray that we be so encouraged about our job as sowers, praying that the seed would take root in the good soul. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for visiting. Find us at www.islandbaptistchurch.org.